You're not religious and aren't atheists. I know it's not your usual content, but is there any chance you'd be willing to make a video on evolution versus creationism, please? My daughter made the statement that one can't believe in a God and evolution. We've talked about it before. I think it would be good for her to see content about it. I understand this isn't your thing. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Let's talk about it. There's a few disclaimers before I start. Uh, one, I am not in the practice of telling people what to believe. So I won't be doing that in this video. Uh, I believe that whatever your faith or lack of faith may look like it is for you to practice and do what you want as long as you're not hurting anyone or trying to force your beliefs onto anyone. All right, that's that's disclaimer number one. Disclaimer number two, I grew up in the church. I was a Christian Methodist for about 14, maybe 15 years. Uh, so that's my background. I did performances in the church. I had all the books of the Bible memorized, all that stuff. I was about that life, okay? Uh, so that's my background. Disclaimer number three is about atheism. A lot of people are confused as to what that means. A lot of people are under the impression that atheism is the belief that there is no God. And that is a specific kind of atheism called Gnostic atheism. Most atheists are agnostic atheists, which means that they don't know if there's a God, but they don't believe there is because they haven't had sufficient evidence for it. If you were to say there is a God, a Gnostic atheist would say, no, there is not. An agnostic atheist would say, unless you can show me proof of this, I don't believe you. Right. So there's a difference. I would be an agnostic atheist. It's a bit of clarification for those wondering. All right. Let's talk about evolution versus creationism. I'm going to talk about evolution first and then I'll talk about creationism. I'm going to explain what evolution is and how it works, because a lot of people don't actually know. Now, plants evolve as well, but I'm going to be using animals for this explanation just for the sake of simplicity, okay? When an animal is born, it inherits the traits of its parents, right? It gets its genetic code from its parents, and so its traits are from either parent or a combination of both parents. If one of the parents has red hair, the offspring might have red hair. If one of the parents has blue eyes, offspring might have blue eyes. If one of the parents is tall, the offspring might be tall, right? We understand that. Evolution is just that happening to a population over generations and generations. That's that's the simplest way you can understand it. But Sai, how does a population inherit the same traits? Thank you for asking. I will explain. The process is called natural selection. I will give you an example of what that looks like. Let's say that you are a large cat. Your parents are large cats. They gave birth to a litter of large cats. Uh, and you live in an area that's really, really cold, right? Now, you were born with thicker fur than the, than the rest of your litter, right? Some animals are born bigger than others. Some animals are born smaller. That's just how life works. You happen to be born with thicker fur. So you're warmer than your family member. You all grow up to have your own litters of cat. Well, some of you grow up. Some of you die because it's just too cold. And you, and you just die from the cold. Some of you die because there's not enough food because it's so cold and food is scarce in the cold, right? But you survive and you survive longer than your siblings do because you can stay warmer and can catch prey easier because of your thicker fur, right? So you have more offspring than your siblings do and the, than the other large cats in the area do you have more offspring, right? You have more offspring because you live longer because of your fur. Um, and your offspring, some of them will inherit the thin fur of your parents, but some of them will inherit your thicker fur, right? So now there's more thicker fur, big cats roaming around having, and they're gonna have offspring. And so of your offspring, the thinner fur ones, a lot of them will die out. And a lot of the thicker fur ones will survive for longer and have their own offspring. And generation after generation, there's going to be more and more thicker furred cats because they survive longer because they can stay warmer. And the thinner fur ones usually die out, right? The animals that have traits that allow them to survive longer in that environment will pass down those traits to their offspring. That's, that's natural selection. Animals that do not have that trait either die out or leave. They go somewhere where they can survive better, right? Now, that natural selection over generations, that's going to result in basic, at some point, it's just going to all be cats. All the big cats are going to have thicker fur because that's what they need in order to survive better 
in their environment, right? That's how you get an entire population that has inherited the trait of thicker fur. That's what evolution is. That that is evolution. There's enough different traits in the population. At some point, we just call it either like a different species or a different breed or a subspecies. We start categorizing them based on those differences if they're significant enough. That's what evolution is. It's provable because we can observe this happening. Does that make sense? But Sa, if we came from monkeys, how come they're still monkeys? Humans did not come from monkeys. Humans and chimps, which are not monkeys, share a common ancestor. It's like you and a cousin can share the same common grandma, but you didn't come from your cousin. It's the same thing. Remember, I said some of the animals with the thinner fur just die out because it's too cold. Other ones leave and go somewhere else. And wherever they go, they will be under the the pressure of a different natural selection. They'll be in a different environment, so they will feel a different natural selection. They will evolve differently, and you'll have a different version of the cat. Those cats that left and evolved differently, they still shared ancestor with the thicker furred cats. That would be your parents, right? So even though they two evolved totally different ways, they have a common ancestor, which is your parents. That's that's how that works. Whew, that was a lot. Okay, everyone good? We all feeling it? Are, are we all on the same page? Uh, we're going to do the creationism one. I'll make it shorter, okay? Creationism is the belief that a God created everything. That's it. Generally speaking, that would make evolution an irrelevant concept if you believe that God just made all the different species and subspecies and no one, no, nothing evolved into anything else. However, depending on how strict your belief is, like how closely you stick to biblical text and stuff like that, you do have some wiggle room in your belief. The simplest way you could think about it is just God created evolution, and then you can run with that. Like, you could say that God created the earth in seven days, but you can just say, well, those were seven God days, which are much longer than human days. So really, it was like millions of years, right? Fortunately, no matter how you choose to follow the Bible, you're going to have to deal with contradictions and things that you're just going to have to ignore. Like if you do the math of the Bible, it would suggest that the earth's only like 6,000 years old. So you're going to have to like try to work around or like the proper way to beat your slaves or when it's okay to stone a woman to death. Like there's, there's going to be stuff that you have to be like, okay, let's ignore that. Uh, yeah, it's in there, but that's bad. And we don't do that right now. Me personally, personal belief here, I look at Christianity and other monotheistic religions in the same way that I look at mythology. I recognize its usefulness. I recognize that they've got a creation story to try to explain, you know, how the world became the way it was. I recognize it's got a lot of life lessons and lessons on how to be a good person. It gives an explanation for what happens when you die. And all of these things can be really useful for people. I think religion is good for people who need those kinds of things. I just don't reach so far into it as to think that those things actually happened on this planet that I currently live on, right? Like, I don't believe that a guy named Hercules physically held up the sky temporarily because I live here and I know how the sky works, right? In the same vein, I don't believe that a serpent told a woman to eat of a fruit because I live here and I know that serpents can't talk. I don't believe that a senior citizen built a boat big enough to house two of every animal on the planet and then gathered two of every animal on the planet to be on that boat for an extended period of time and none of them ate each other. I don't think that that happened in real life on this planet because I know how the planet works. I live here. Religion is useful for explaining the unexplained. Religion gives us peace in life and in death, tells us that the terrible people who seem to be thriving will be punished after they die, tells us that the good people who are suffering will be rewarded after they die. And that gives people peace about death. It gives people motivation to be good. It gives people fear to be bad. Motivation to be good is a good thing, but fear of being bad is a bad thing if the rules for what is good come from a book that we accept has a lot of bad stuff in it right? So you got to be careful about that fear aspect, but practice how you want, believe what you want. As long as you're not hurting anyone or trying to force anything on anyone, do what you want. That is my breakdown. I'll see you guys in the next video.